You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Another fun-filled episode. I am, as always, your humble host. And today, we are joined by Frederick M. Lawrence once again today. We are discussing affirmative action as it pertains to the Supreme Court. Frederick Lawrence, welcome to the Brian Nichols Show. Good to be back, Brian. How are you? I'm doing well and noticeably absent today. My computer decided to, uh, last minute, of course, lose video for whatever reason. So that's fun. But uh, hey, at least I'm the floating head today. And folks get to see you today, which is nice. So thank you for joining the program. And uh, with that being said, Dr. Lawrence, it's been a little bit since you were last in the show. Uh, how have things been since uh, you were last on the program? What's been new in the world of Dr. Frederick M. Lawrence? So far, the uh, the work of Phi Beta Kappa, where I'm the secretary and CEO, continues apace. We've been involved in advocacy work for the liberal arts and sciences, higher education in particular. Uh, that involves advocacy with respect to making the case for the liberal arts. That involves funding for higher education. It's a lot of activity going on, and I'm happy to tell you that our supporters continue to support us and students continue to join. So things are, are good at Phi Beta Kappa. You'd love to hear it. You'd love to hear it. Well, well, thank you so much for, for returning to the program. And obviously uh, today we are discussing one of the most, uh, I would say, talked about top of mind topics for if you're in the world of academia, probably in the past 10, 15 years, that is the uh, the concept of affirmative action. Now hitting the Supreme Court uh, where we've seen this conversation uh, more so in the, I would say the culture than it has really gotten into the, the legal standing as much as it has right now with the traction it's getting. So Dr. Lawrence, let's kind of set the stage here. Where where are we in terms of this affirmative action case? How do we get here? And and I guess let's kind of set the 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 tone in terms of what where we are now and where this might take us. Let's do a little quick history here. The first affirmative action case the Supreme Court decided is now over 40 years old. That's 1978, the case of uh, Alan Bakke in the University of California. Uh, that was a case in which the court uh, was dealing with actual quotas that the University of California had for the medical school. Out of 100 seats, uh, something like 20 seats out of the class were reserved for people of color. The court did two things in 1978. It struck down quotas, but it upheld the use of race as one factor. Can't be the only factor and it can't be the determining factor, but as one factor in the admissions process. So in fact, for people who follow the court, it was a very interesting configuration of the court. There were four justices who would have upheld the entire thing that the University of California was doing. There were four justices who would have struck the whole thing down. And there was one justice, Lewis Powell, who joined with four saying you can't have quotas. He joined with a conservative block of the court to make five votes to say you can't have quotas. But then he turned around and he joined with the four more liberal justices to make a block of five to say, but you may take race into account. That's 1978. That pretty much still remains the law of the land. It came back to the court in a couple of cases involving the University of Michigan in the early part of this century, and then again, the University of Texas in 2016. Now, Brian, the part that's, apart, that's surprising here is if you've been following the dates I just gave you, it was 25 years from the first case to the next one. Then it was about 15 years from the second case to the third. Now we're only six years after the most recent case. So this is accelerating the reconsideration of affirmative action. Why is that going on? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that there are two very prominent cases that are up in the system right now, one coming from a private school, Harvard University, the other coming from a public school, University of North Carolina. But of course, the other issue that everybody's talking about is that the composition of the court has dramatically changed in the last couple of years. So there is reason to believe that for the first time in history, the Supreme Court will strike down the use of race conscious admissions policies that have been upheld since 1978. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And I guess right now, a lot of the audience is probably saying, well, is that necessarily a bad thing? And right. and I guess I will, let me let me ask that question in a more eloquent way because we hear the, the, the idea of race playing a factor in admissions. And I think at your core, your average person kind of goes, ah, like that just doesn't feel right. Um, hearing it, that I guess being the, the case. So what, what are your... Thoughts there, Dr. Lawrence. What to my concerns and maybe to some of my audience's concerns, are are we seeing things through a prism that you're maybe not quite on board with, or, or do you see empathy in, in our, our positions? Of course, I see empathy in your position because the issues of race in our country going back to our very founding, and in fact, a long time before our founding, have been among the 
core dilemmas that we've dealt with, how we've dealt with issues of race in this country. So it's not surprising in 2022, we're still having complicated, difficult, sometimes tense conversations about race. Brian, I would situate this issue in the context of academic freedom. You go back to that Bakke opinion that I mentioned in 1978, the court relied on an opinion that Felix Frankfurter wrote back in the 1950s, where he identified what he called the four core principles of academic freedom. And that is that universities get to decide who attends, who teaches there, what they teach, and how they teach it. Now, they can't just do that, making it up out of thin air. It's got to be related to the core mission of the institution. But so long as that's what they're doing, then they are the deciders as to who attends the institution in order to accomplish its mission, who teaches there, what they teach, and how they teach it. So staying with that who teaches here idea, uh, who, who attends here idea, the notion is that different schools will approach this differently, but they are allowed to say what's going to be the best mix of students to give us a rich and vibrant learning environment. I can tell you, for example, that I have taught criminal law and criminal procedure for over 30 years now. If you have a monochromatic class, everybody's the same color, then issues of race, which are deeply involved in criminal law and criminal procedure uh, in American law, teach differently. The professor has to lecture certain things in, which is a much less effective way of getting issues out than when they come from the students. So the admissions office says, if we do our job right, we're going to get a blend of students. We're going to get a mix of students. And no, we're not going to have a quota and say we need 5% of this and 10% of that. But we just want to make sure that everything is taken into account so that you don't have 100% of only one thing and zero of everything else. I, and I think it was very refreshing, candidly, to hear the word freedom the freedom to be able to make those decisions i had dr adrian bajan on the program back mm -hmm. a few months ago and he's he's a big proponent in promoting that f word in academia um because unfortunately a lot of professors are, are afraid to to say it and i'm glad to hear that there is more of a push right now and, and we do have an opportunity to install much more of a, a pro freedom of, and your your uh, way you framed it, uh, Dr. Lawrence, much more freedom of education and freedom of choice in that perspective. But I would say it's also the freedom of association, um, mm -hmm. and really the free thought of ideas, being able to have you know be able to have this conversation right now. That's huge because before I don't think we were even able to have this conversation without it instantly being looked at through a completely different lens. Um, so I'm glad we're able to have this conversation. So where are we heading? And and I guess this is where a lot of folks are curious. You mentioned we have the, the Supreme Court right now with more of a conservative lean. So there obviously is much more momentum to, to take a step forward here in, in approaching affirmative action. Where do you see this case going? And then what do you think the implications will be as we, we look at academia five, 10 years from now? Let's start with where this case is likely going. And to do that, let's set the stage by going back to the most recent time the Supreme Court took this up, the University of Texas case, Fisher against University of Texas. That's 2016. In 2016, the court upheld Texas's affirmative action uh, procedures and plans by a vote of four to three. Now, if you're doing the arithmetic, that sounds like they're short two justices, and they are. It was four to three. The reason there are two justices missing, one is Justice Elena Kagan had been the Solicitor General of the United States at the time that case started its way through the courts. So she had to recuse herself. The assumption was Justice Kagan would have been in favor of affirmative action from other writing that she's done. So that would have made it five to three. Now, the other missing vote was Justice Scalia, who had just passed away. So that was an open seat. Now, if you remember in 2016, President Obama named Merrick Garland to that seat. Had Merrick Garland been confirmed from everything we've read about his writings on the subject, he too would have been in favor of the legality of affirmative action. That would have been six to three for affirmative action. Well, obviously that's not how things uh, played out. Merrick Garland is not on the Supreme Court. Instead, uh, Justice Gorsuch, who is likely an opponent of affirmative action takes that position. That moves us back down to 5-4 if you're doing the head count. Now watch how this starts to move. Justice Kennedy stepped down from the court. Justice Kennedy voted with the majority, in fact, wrote the majority opinion in the University of Texas case. He is replaced by Justice Kavanaugh. We don't know for sure, but there's reason to believe Justice Kavanaugh also will be opponent of affirmative action. That now flips it to 4-5, or if you will, 
five for against affirmative action. And finally, and most recently, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, replaced by Justice Amy Coney Barrett, um, who was believed to be an opponent of affirmative action. So you see how what might have been 6-3 in one direction has turned to 6-3 in the other direction rather quickly. Now, having said that, the truth is we don't know for sure how some of these justices will in fact vote. We do know we do know that there are the three dissenters from the University of Texas case who are still on the court. The assumption is they will still take the same position. And then we've got three new justices. We have to see how they will vote. But in all likelihood, they will be in favor of curtailing affirmative action, maybe eliminating affirmative action. Now, your question is what happens next for higher education? My sense is that it will not be a single impact for all higher educational institutions. Smaller schools, and more affluent schools will be able to afford the resources or have few enough applications that they can still do a pretty careful read through application by application. And they will still be able to say, we're going to have a diverse class and they will not be looking at race per se, but in their look for diversity, it will be a class that will continue to be ethnically diverse. For the larger schools that have some of them 25, 50, some over 100,000 applications, that's simply not feasible. If they can't give any attention formally to race, then I think those schools are going to have a much harder time having racial diversity represented in their class. And the best way to, uh, to predict that is what happened in California after the law changed prohibiting the use of race at all as a factor, even if the United States Constitution permitted it, California law now does not. And when that happened, the percentage of students of color at the University of California system uh, did decrease noticeably. So I would predict that what will happen in our big state universities, if in fact affirmative action is struck down, is that the racial diversity of those classes will be reduced in some places substantially. In our smaller schools and our more affluent schools, the difference will be much less significant, I suspect. Well, Dr. Lewis, I know we have, unfortunately, a hard stop here. Uh, you have to go teach class. You got to help get the uh, the future masses learned. So we're going to go ahead and let you go do that. But a thank you. Obviously, we wanted to bring your perspective here to the program and to the audience, because this is, again, a conversation that is top of mind, especially as it heads to the Supreme Court. So thank you for bringing your insights to the audience. Any final thoughts you want to leave the, uh, the audience with today? This is clearly an important issue. It's one worth watching. I do think there is a concern when the court changes direction quite so quickly because the composition of the court changes. Courts have always been above the political fray. If you listen to the words of Stephen Breyer, just announced his retirement from the court, he, you can tell he's almost pleading uh, with the court itself and with the public more generally to look at the court as something other than just another political institution. When we have these dramatic changes, and it's not just going to be in issues uh, such as affirmative action. We're going to see it with abortion cases this term and perhaps future uh, cases going forward uh, involving abortion rights. When you have these dramatic changes because of the composition of the court changing, what it starts to look like is that the court is not dealing with principles of law, but is dealing with the politics of the justices. If that is to happen, I say two things to watch out for. Number one, I think that hurts the integrity and the legitimacy of the court. Number two, watch the Chief Justice. Chief Justice Roberts is very conservative on many of these issues by his own leaning, but he cares deeply about the structure of the court, about the reputation of the court, and about the legacy of the Supreme Court. So you may see Chief Justice Roberts putting the brakes on a little bit for dramatic change, if, if possible for him to do so, because he wants to protect the integrity of the court. Having said that, we're living in a time where there are five very conservative justices without the chief justice. So he alone cannot change it. He is no longer the swing justice. He can join the three more liberal members of the court, but that's not enough to make a majority. A lot to keep our, our eye on. And uh, with that being said, folks, if you want to make sure you are, in fact, keeping your eye on what's happening, well, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'll include all the links to Dr. Lawrence's social media, as well as all the links to Phi Beta Kappa and where you can go ahead and see all that's happening uh, in this, this case as we, we go on. I'm sure uh, Dr. Lawrence will be sharing his thoughts there as well. So, folks, uh, thank you for joining us on the program. If you got value from today's episode, please do us a solid. Go ahead and share it. But with that being said, Dr. Frederick M. Lawrence, thanks for joining the program pleasure. Nice being with you, Brian. Take care. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. 
Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe. Want to help us reach more people? Give the show a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe too. Find us at briannicholsshow.com and download the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow me on social media at B Nichols Liberty and consider donating to the show at briannicholsshow.com forward slash support. The Brian Nichols Show is supported by viewers like you. Thank you to our patrons, Daryl Schmitz, Laura Stanley, Michael Lima, Mitchell Mankiewicz, Cody Johns, Craig DaCosta, and the We Are Libertarians Network. Audio production for The Brian Nichols Show is brought to you by DB Podcast Audio. Learn more by emailing inquiries to william at dbpodaudio.com.